Hi, this tutorial will show you how to get started with dgraph. This tutorial will closely follow the written one, which can be found at docs.dgraph.io slash get started. The version of dgraph that I will be using is 0.8.0. .0. So, the first thing you need to do is to install dgraph. There are two main ways of doing so, either by using install script or by using a Docker image. I've already installed dgraph using an install script, but if you would like to follow this tutorial using a Docker image, you can feel free to do so. Just note that running dgraph will be different, but all the queries will be the same. Now let's get on to running dgraph. The first thing I'm going to do is create a new folder, and I'm going to run dgraph in this folder, as dgraph creates its folders in the folder it is currently running in. So now that I've run dgraph, we can look at our first query. There are two ways to programmatically execute queries, either via the HTTP API or through the gRPC API. In this, for this tutorial, I'll be running all queries through the HTTP API through the web interface. By default, the HTTP server of dgraph runs on port 8080. So here, I'll be executing all of my queries. These queries executed on the web interface will be identical to be running them on the query endpoint, such as through this curl command here. So let's look at our first mutation query we have. So note that graph our dgraph's query language is called GraphQL plus minus. It is based on Facebook's GraphQL, however, there are some differences between it. If you'd like to learn more about the differences between GraphQL and GraphQL plus minus, there is more information available on the documentation. I will, however, will not be covering this in this video. So let's look at this mutation query we have here. We first specify that it's a mutation query, and that we're going to be setting some values in it. Then we have the, all these bunches of values specified. So each value, for each line, is in a format called triples. They are in RDF ENCODES format, which specifies that there are three space-separated values followed by a period. So these three space-separated values are the subject, the predicate, and then the object, which defines that the subject is being is pointing to using the predicate you can imagine as a directed edge in a graph to an object so in this specific line we have Luke which has a predicate of name pointing to a string Luke Skywalker so you may also notice that some of these identifiers start with underscore colon and this is because since we are setting new values we don't have an existing identifier in which we can refer to so in this case, we leave it to the database to generate a new identifier, thus effectively inserting new values into the database. And you can even see here that we have a relationship between two documents in the database. We have SW1, which has a predicate starring, pointing to Luke. So when this query executes, all of the identifiers beginning with underscore colon will be replaced with newly generated unique identifiers. This also means that these tags effectively will not be stored in the database. They are temporary and local to only the current query. So now if we run this query, we can see that in our response, we get a code of success, and then we also get all the UIDs back in JSON format. So I can see all the UIDs that are generated for each of the different values we inserted. So now we have some data in the database, we can do a bit more. So this next query we have here is a mutation on the schema. So the schema mutation will specify a predicate, and then the type in which the predicate should be, and then some more parameters such as whether we want to index it. So in this case, we have a name, whose type string, which will be indexed, a release date predicate, date time, which will be indexed, revenue predicate, which will be type float, running time predicate will be type int. If you notice, when we initially made our mutation set query, we inserted all values as strings. Now this is where the schema comes in, as it will convert these strings into different types that you specify in the schema. So now that we will execute this mutation, the schema, and we can see the code successful again. So now we can execute our first query that will read from the database. So here we have this query. The first thing is, as you may notice, it's very similar to GraphQL, you know, a standard query in GraphQL. The first value we have here is just a simple identifier to basically call the root element. This doesn't really have a significant effect 
on the result, it just changes what the root dictionary value is going to be called. Inside this here in the brackets, we have our main function that will be executed as the main component of the query. In this case, we're going to match the name predicate with all the terms of the string, the string Star Wars. So basically, match the name predicate with the word Star Wars. And then after running this query, we're going to apply a filter, which is going to find where the name, sorry, the release date predicate is greater than or equal to 1980. So effectively, this query will return all Star Wars movies whose release date is greater than or equal to 1980. And if we look a bit more in this query, we're also going to retrieve the director values and starring values, which we know are predicates to other documents in the database. I'm going to retrieve the names. So now if we run this query, we can see that the web UI of dgraph does generate a nice little graph relationship diagram. It can generate a tree and also represents, also generates the JSON, which you will see when executing these queries with a programming language. So in this response, we can see the main root document, and then we can see the director being resolved into an array, and all the values populated. We can see the three, three movie, uh, to the two movies retrieved from the database, with all the values populated, and all the nodes that you'd expect to be joined. So that concludes the getting started tutorial for dgraph. If you'd like to learn more about how to use dgraph, then head over to tour.dgraph.io, where there are step-by-step -step tours showing you how to use all the features in dgraph. In the future, more videos will be posted for this tour. I hope you found this video useful, and thanks for watching.